Good morning. Good morning. How are we today? Before we do, I do want to say hello to each of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so very much for logging on. And I see that there's Daria. Hi, my beautiful radical crazy. Hello, Sean. Thank you, thank you, thank you so very much for logging on. We're going to go ahead and get started. Everyone wants to live a life of enjoyment. Everyone wants to live a life of health. Everyone wants to live a life of peace, but no one has figured out how until now. The answer is simple. Alignment is key. Alignment is key to living a life of enjoyment. Alignment is key to living a life of health. Alignment is key to living a life of peace. And when I speak of the word alignment, I'm referring to your spirit, your mind, and your body, all working harmoniously towards the progression of who you, you, and you were created to be. I am Jane S. Green, your spirit, mind, and body strategist, and I invite you to take a walk with me along this spiritual journey I call life, so that together we get to rediscover who we truly are, spiritually, mentally, and physically. For those of you who are still popping on, thank you, thank you, thank you. We're gonna go ahead and start our prayer. If you would, bow your head. Father God, I thank you so very much for this opportunity to be used by you. Father God, I ask that you deplete me of all of who I am and fill me with all of who you are. Father God, I ask that your Holy Spirit take permanent residence within me from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. Father God, allow your Holy Spirit to have its way. Father God, I ask you to bless each person who pops on, who listens, and who watches the replay. Father, meet them right where they are. Give them everything that they need in order to become all that you, Father God, have ordained them to become. Father God, I want to say a special prayer for my guest, Erica Joseph. Father God, I ask you to allow her to have favor with man and with you. Father God, ensure that everything she touches prospers and succeeds. Father God, I ask you to strengthen her life as she continues to do what you've called her to do. Keep your love and protected arms around her marriage and around her children. Father God, we ask these blessings in your beautiful Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I can't really see all of the names, but I do want to take the time to say hello. Thank you, Rihanna. Hi, Andrea. Thank you, thank you, thank you all so very much for logging on. Our foundation scripture is going to come from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. And it reads, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive of every thought 
to make it obedient to Christ. And that comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5. If you've been watching these Facebook Live videos, you know that there are three concepts that I absolutely love discussing. These three concepts, they work together to make us who we truly are. And once we understand how each one of the three concepts work separately, and then how all three work harmoniously, we begin to show up as our true authentic selves. Nevertheless, we are here today to talk about all things mental. Dr. Joseph and I would like to shed light on a topic that will hopefully spark some meaningful conversations within our homes, within our schools, and within our communities. So that once we are able to have the information that we need, we're better informed of the signs and symptoms of mental illnesses, as well as learn some possible preventative measures to take in order to maintain a healthy mental state. Remember that all of the information that you hear today is for educational purposes only. You will have to get in contact with your personal mental health provider in order to access and or diagnose any concerns that you may have. Our special guest is a board certified psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner, and she's also a family nurse practitioner. Dr. Joseph has been a member of the nursing profession for 20 years. She's worked as a nurse practitioner in the specialty area of psychiatry, mental health for the past 10 years. She earned her bachelor's of science in nursing in December of 1999 and a master of science in nursing in May of 2008 from the Southern University. She earned her post-master degree in psychiatry and mental health from Southeastern Louisiana University in December of 2012. She completed her Doctor of Nursing practice program at the Southern University in December of 2015, and she is currently enrolled in a PhD program at the Southern University. Dr. Joseph, as you can see, is an extremely accomplished mental health professional. She is a current fellow of the Substance Abuse Mental Health Administration Minority Fellowship Program. She was selected as the 2015 Louisiana Nurses Foundation Advanced Practice Nurse of the Year in 2015. She was also selected one of 10 nurses to receive the national honor as a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. She has been featured in national nursing publications. She's been appointed to national advisory councils, and she is committed to raising awareness and understanding of mental and substance use disorders, particularly with minority veterans. After all of that, Dr. Joseph does still have a personal life. She is the president of the Louisiana Tri Parish Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated. She is married to Lancey Joseph Esquire and the proud mother of three beautiful daughters. Need I say any more? Please welcome Dr. Erica Joseph. Thank you, Sarah J. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you. Thank you for agreeing to do this interview. I'm so happy and honored that I'm able to sit down and talk with you about an issue that is prevalent in our community as well as other communities as well. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure always to share. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started. How did, how did you come in contact with this particular career? Was psychiatric mental health something that you always knew you wanted to pursue, or was it something that just kind of landed in your lap? Well, psychiatric mental health nursing, it was not something that I pursued. Okay. I, I would not have seen myself here today. Oh. Um, actually, I, as you mentioned, I finished as a family nurse practitioner. And when I graduated, I applied for several jobs in primary care setting and to work in a rural area. And um, in one of those application process, it actually happened to be a psychiatry uh, practice appointment. 
and I did not realize that it was not not like notifications were not in the uh, listing and the requirements. And so the psychiatrist placed a phone call to me and he said, I see your background is primarily ICU because I've been an ICU nurse at that point for like 10 years and I had no psychiatry experience. Now our um, family nurse practitioner program, it did prepare us to treat depression, anxiety, you know, um, just the uh, basic mood disorder, but nothing, you know, for severe mental illness. And so I said to him, I don't know if I want to come in and interview. I'm not a psych nurse. Yeah. And so he encouraged me to just come on in and talk with him. And so I did. And he said, look at it as a learning curve. And so I was open-minded. And so I could actually just say, for those of you who may not even uh, consider things or may not be thinking about things, that was not my path. But I did go in with an open mind and I have no regrets. And so that's some advice I can give to just be open and receive things. And then I sat in church after um, interviewing. It was like all in the same week, I promise you. And the message that week was about being on assignment. And I received that word and I felt like it was for me because it said you would find yourself in places, meeting people, you know, showing up somewhere. You have no idea why you were there but just accept it as your assignment and you're there for that season and you go there and you do what you can. And so 10 years later, I'm still there. Awesome. I, I got the job. You just, it just felt right. And so I won't say it was coincidental. I would say it was just divine that I was supposed to be there at the right time at the right place. I agree. Yeah. And I, I love how God worked that out for yeah, you. Yeah, it worked out. That was a validation that you were definitely on assignment. Definitely. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So I heard you mention um, anxiety and depression, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of misconceptions when it comes to mental health. What does mental health include? So mental health includes uh, and involves looking at our psychological, um, our social, emotional well-being, looking at how we think about things, how we feel about things, how we behave in certain ways. And, um, and just making sure, like you mentioned earlier, everything's aligned and everything's in balance. And when we face with mental health problems, of course, sometimes those things can, you know, not be aligned. And what ends up happening, the person may have um, some biological factors that may have uh, come into play, meaning it could be an imbalance in the uh, chemicals within their brain, like the brain chemistry that could be an imbalance, or it could be... Uh, a family, a genetic history of mental health problems in that family, or it could just be um, just environmental trauma or abuse that someone has experienced that will then cause them to have mental health problems. I like that you pointed out that mental health includes the way we think and how we feel. Mm -hmm. And I think oftentimes we are operating on autopilot. Right. And we're not aware of not. the thoughts that we have and right. how we're actually yeah. feeling. Our mind is so powerful. And so, I mean, you can believe something and it will be, you know, and your mind will take you there. And so you just have to be careful with your thoughts and your thinking and then how you respond to others, you know, what others do to you and how you respond to that is so uh, important. And, and, and you have in, in, in protecting, when I say important, in protecting your uh, mental health and well being. Right. Yeah. I remember reading a book and it stated, you know, a lot of people spend a lot of time working on their bodies. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, before you work on your body, yeah. you want to work on your mind. Exactly. Yeah. I agree with that. And I actually share that with all the clients I work with because I feel if you do not take care of your mind, your mental health well-being there's nothing you can do physically because your mind i feel it starts there it drives everything so if if mentally you are unbalanced then you cannot take care of your basic you know basic physical needs so i believe it all starts there yeah i, I totally agree your mind yeah. controls your body so oh, yeah making sure you take care of that mental health is definitely very it's very important okay in your professional opinion and I know that um, a lot of individuals, well, not a lot, but some are experiencing some disorders. Mm -hmm. But for those individuals who are not experiencing mental disorders, 
what are some things that they can do to maintain a healthy mental state? Um, I would start first. I'll give you uh, the first thing I would say, um, as, as she mentioned, we all have a lot going on. We have busy lives and um, I would say stress comes up on the top of the list for a lot of us just in our day to day life and how we uh, approach things and we have this place to be that place to be. So I would say uh, approaching a mental state begins with your ability to manage the stress. Um, I feel like if you have an overwhelming amount of stress and you do not manage it properly, then it leads to, I always tell my patients, overwhelming stress or unmanaged stress turns to distress, meaning it will affect you physically, it will affect you mentally. And so um, a lot of times the, that manifests itself in, uh, you know, upset stomach, you know, diarrhea, constipation, nausea, headaches, you know, um, and then mentally, persons feel irritable, agitated, uh, they have problems sleeping, they have problems thinking, concentrating, um, just loss of interest in things. And so I feel if you are able to manage that stress and, and do it in a healthy way, because there are unhealthy ways to manage stress, right? It's people mm -hmm. tend to want to drink, or consume alcohol, drugs, whatnot, to um, manage their stress level. And that's an unhealthy way to manage stress. So finding healthy ways to manage the stress, I, I believe is important in managing your healthy state. Okay. What are some of the things that you do to manage your stress? Because, you know, we just right, I'm looked at your active. resume yeah. and we know that you are extremely, I'm extremely busy. Yeah. yeah. It takes a whole lot of work. It, it takes hard work. Um, I do. Um, I, and, and the thing is consistency. Right, because we know what to do, but consistency needs to be your focus. And so, um, meditation for me is um, really big. And days when I don't meditate, then I'm off that day. I could be, but meditation for me helps me to keep our inner peace. So, amongst all the chaos that's going on around you, if you can keep that inner peace within yourself, and if you can keep that your space positive, then you can. Um, protect your mental state. And so I really don't allow negative things in my space. If I feel things are getting negative, then I, I, I have to step back and I have to let that person know that as well. And so I feel like it's, it's meditation. I try to exercise and walk a few times um, or ride the bike when I can. I don't do that as much. I really like bike riding, but that's something I like to do. I have a support system, friend, family, friends who check on me. I attend church. Um, that's another important piece for me that helps keep me going. And um, I can't leave out nutrition. Um, I, I still work on that. I'll be honest with you guys, because sometimes you can get so busy, you can't get a healthy meal. But um, diet is always important. Any type, anytime I go to a treatment plan or a healthcare plan, if it's medical or mental, it goes back to our diet. And so those are some of the things that I do to maintain a healthy state. I love that you pointed out that you meditate mm -hmm. and keeping that inner peace mm -hmm. and protecting your energy whenever you sense negativity coming, you take that step right. back. Right. So it's very good mm -hmm. for us to ensure that we're one practicing keeping our mental state healthy right. and two having those boundaries and you have to and I would say because a lot of things can happen around us, right? And, and we're either at work or, you know, organizations or whatever we're in and involved in, or even family, we cannot, you know, manage or control how somebody's gonna react to us or what somebody may do to us. But what we can control is how we respond. And that's so key to protecting your mental um, health and well being, Because if they're out of control and then you're out of control, and then that's not you, then you feeling bad about something that happened. And some people can let it go and some can't. So I would say just controlling the way you uh, allow others into your space and then how you're going to respond to it is important. Awesome. Phenomenal. Now, this, this next question, it, it, it kind of hits home for me. Mm -hmm. You know, growing up as a little girl, I would... Um, visit my grandmother quite frequently. And there were some things she would say 
to me, being a little girl, that didn't make sense. And I learned, you know, as I got older that, you know, some of the things she said, you know, didn't make sense to other people. Mm -hmm. It made sense to her. And some of the things she did, you know, they were kind of questionable. Mm -hmm. And we really didn't know what was going on because we didn't have the information that we now have. Mm -hmm. But in the African-American community, mm -hmm. why is there a stigma around mental health issues? Mm -hmm. Um, in my opinion, and I believe that um, there's a stigma in the Af African American community um, because we just uh, don't talk about it, I feel, enough. And there has been um, a situation where you keep that quiet. Um, or I've had situations where patients have come in where that's uncle such and such, he's just crazy. We're going to leave him alone. And so you have all the negative language and negative talk about a person who's actually suffering and living with a mental illness, you know, calling them crazy. Uh, oh, you're going to see a shrink, you know, all the negative things that it, you know, really um, forces them to not want to seek help. Um, the other interesting thing I will tell you, I have had clients of African uh, American clients to tell me is questioning their faith uh, mm -hmm. by coming in to see uh, a counselor or uh, someone like myself to talk about their problems because, you know, growing up in the church, you pray about your problems. And so that was another uh, interesting thing. And so I, I believe that just having more conversations within our faith community, uh, within our schools, I mean, we should be talking about mental health everywhere because it's everywhere. I mean, if we keep living, you keep getting up every day, we will have you know, your problems with mental health. It's just life. It's just how things go. And so I think if we do more of what you're doing here today by inviting me to speak uh, with your audience, um, open in, in the schools, we talk about diabetes, we talk about cancer, we talk about hypertension, we talk about sickle cell, but we don't talk about mental health and mental health problems. And uh, I think until we start having these conversations in the places where we can meet our African American families and friends, um, I think that that's um, one of our main problems that we not, uh, you know, we're not talking about it in a, in a sense to where they can feel comfortable and not feel judged, right? Um, to say something's wrong with me or, and I'm like, it's not. I always have to tell patients and clients that it's nothing wrong with you. Um, and to look at them as a human being and an individual. And so I, that's like my goal every day, to let them know they're not their um, illness or their disease. You are uh, you know, a human being first right. with this disorder or with this illness. And so once you get the persons to accept their illness and their families and their friends to support them, I think that we'll see you know, more openly um, that they will be willing to go in for help and for treatment. So, yeah. Thank you. I, I like that you said the com it begins with the conversation. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, if we don't talk about it, mm -hmm. we pretend as if it's not there. Right. And then it gets pushed under the rug until mm -hmm. something dramatic right. happens. And then, then we'll walk. yeah, mm -hmm. we can't help but to talk about it. Right. So, because the signs are there, typically, the signs are there. But if you're ignoring it and you're thinking it's just going to go away, it's not. What are some of the signs? Yeah. And so it could start off with uh, some, like I've mentioned, um, there could be a uh, problems with sleeping. Okay. There could be problems with um, mood changes where they lost interest in things. They're isolating themselves, difficulty concentrating, um, just the agitation, irritability, a feeling of hopelessness. Mm. You know, that's just more of our mood disorders. But if you're speaking to someone and you, you know that thoughts are not organized, right? They're not speaking logically. You know, they, they're, they're making saying words that, that didn't even make sense. Then that should prompt you that, hey, something's not wrong, right? Okay. Or if they have this strong belief about something that, you know, may not be a reality. Okay. And you just sort of, hmm. Something's not right, you know. Make sure, it should make you stop and think and, and ask that person, you know, if there's your family member, hey, have you seen your your doctor lately? Okay. Yeah. And speaking of asking that question to a member, you may suspect 
that may have it and asking them to go and see mm -hmm. a doctor, a professional healthcare provider. Can you talk to us about some of the concerns as far as mental health goals with payment and maybe family practitioner? What are some of the things that they need to be aware of before they actually seek help as far as payments are concerned? Yeah, um, one thing I would say, um, access to care, um, we all know has been an a ongoing issue. And, and when I speak of access to care, I'm talking about mental health care and physical health care. Um, there are times where an individual may need um, mental health care, but their insurance coverage may not um, offer coverage for that particular um, service. Because some, sometimes there are policies that don't cover family, uh, for instance, family therapy, so a marriage therapy. So you may be ready and willing to go, but you may not have access to care or treatment because your insurance policy doesn't cover it. Another issue may be uh, a number of mental health providers are cash payment, private pay, you know, they don't accept any coverage. And so those are some of the challenges that we face. And I feel that until we actually address our mental health needs, as we address our physical health needs, when we look at access to care and access to treatment and providing the coverage that, um, you know, we will not be really helping this population of patients. We're really doing them a disservice. And so when we look at that expansion of uh, Medicaid that we had, um, that actually allowed a number of people to gain access to care and, and gain access to substance abuse treatment, which is all um, important. I don't look at those separately. I feel like it's dual, you know, because a lot of times I feel patients are using alcohol and drugs to mask their symptoms, they mm -hmm. self-medicating. And so I feel that um, if we can get coverage for that particular substance use treatment, then we can get to their mental health, you know, need and the bottom of what's happening with their mental health. And so I think access to um, providers, access to uh, insurance coverage is going to be key for us to help this population. And you know, I never thought about that until you just mentioned it. A lot of times they do turn to drugs or alcohol mm -hmm. to mask those feelings mm -hmm. that they can't cope oh, yeah. right. with. So yeah, that's, that's quite it, is, it is because if you're if you have an uh like if I'm dealing with a patient who has a psychotic illnesses, well they hear voices, they see visions, and sometimes the voices tell them things about themselves that they don't want to hear. So they can drink lots of alcohol to try to drown that out, or a person who's de depressed, you know, and not able to see the light at the end of the tunnel, they may want to just drink away because they think it's not going to get any better and they find themselves in a hopeless state. Um, because the alcohol, they are depressants, you know, in the end, they will just increase their symptoms. And so I have a difficult time saying, hey, it's only gonna make the matters worse. But at that moment, that's what they have. And then a lot of times, they don't wanna wait till the medication starts working or wait until we get through the uh, counseling session because recovery takes time. Mm -hmm. Recovery is not quick. And so people can get better from mental health problems, but it takes time, it takes consistency, you know, and um, coming in, taking your medicine, seeing your therapist, and putting everything to work that you're gaining from your therapy session. So it's good that we know that it does work, but you yeah. have to follow the orders that your professional health care has given you. Right. You can't self-medicate. You can't self-medicate, <laughs> it's gonna make it worse. You have to follow the recommendations. Um, I can't stress that enough. It's it's like any other treatment plan or healthcare plan. If you were managing, um, say, diabetes, and they tell you exactly what to eat, they tell you exactly what time to take your meds. The same thing for recovery with a mental health problem. Okay. Speaking mm -hmm. of self medication, mm -hmm. now I'm not sure how many of you have watched the film called Limitless. But there's this film with uh, Bradley Cooper who takes this drug and it's called NZT. And with this particular drug he takes, it's able to allow him to use 100% of his brain 
thus improving his lifestyle. Now, there are some companies and individuals who are claiming that this is a true substance. Have you heard of anything similar to this NZT that allows us to use 100% of our brain and improve our lifestyle beyond anything that we can imagine? No, I, I haven't seen a movie. I have not heard of a uh, drug that would um, to do those things 100%. Um, I, I just always uh, tell clients there is no magic pill. I just, I'm upfront. I uh, say we have medication therapy, we have psychotherapy, in combination both, we see the best results. Um, medication therapy is not a quick fix. Mm -hmm. I always say that, it's not a quick fix. Uh, the first initial uh, weeks of medication, they may be side effects, it may be, uh, I don't like what it's doing to my body, my thoughts, my feelings, but you, most times you have to get through those first few weeks and the side effects will subside. But there's no, there, I hadn't seen it yet and I've been working 10 years. It takes a combination. There's no quick fix. It's, it's steady work, it's steady progress. It's taking uh, medication every day. If, if your um, healthcare provider recommends a medication, um, but there is none that's gonna just 100% do anything, I think. It's medication therapy along with your psychotherapy, along with all those other things I just mentioned. Right. Uh, you know, if it's meditation, prayer, whatever uh, it is that keeps you, you know, stable and, you know, in your place, that's what I feel it is. If it's yoga, I do yoga too as much as I can. So it takes all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So listen to audience, I, my audience, I know you, you already know that that pill isn't real. But if you know someone who said, oh, I'm taking this pill and it's, it's going to give you the ability to do this and to do yeah. that, let them know that that pill um, is probably a placebo. Right. But it take, it's a process. It's yeah. a process. Yeah. So let's not self-medicate. And let's make sure that we are following the doctor's orders. And that does include, okay, I feel better, I'm back to normal, or I can stop taking my medication. Right. Can they do that? No. That you don't want to uh, stop medication abruptly because it tends to cause a rebound effect where, you go, like you said, you're going along, you're doing well, immediately you stop their medication and then things just kind of plummet. And so you... If there's something going on and you want to get off of your medication, you just have to seek your medical advice first. You know, speak with your healthcare provider because sometimes those medications can make you feel worse if you stop them abruptly. Mm -hmm. So there's a um, way your provider can help you gradually uh, wean yourself off of them if that's the recommendation. Okay. So, yeah. so far we've talked about managing our stress. And ways for us to manage our stress is to meditate, do yoga, exercise, as well as attend your spiritual, religious place of worship. And after you've done that, you still want to make sure that you check in with your professional mental health care provider just to ensure that all is going well and you have any questions, you would talk with that individual. Is it any other activities or practices that we should partake in? I've heard um, some individuals keep their mind alert and fresh and focused. They do crossword puzzles. What, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I would say, um, and I recommend that um, often. If I have clients who have a lot of idle time, um, I do recommend that. I ask them to what can we do? What activity? What's your interest? Something that we can do to just sort of keep your mind stimulated, right? Um, because I find um, my clients who have mental health problems, if they have a lot of idle time, they can easily slip back into that thing, whatever they've been dealing with, right? Mm -hmm. And so if I, we can develop healthier uh, ways of managing those thoughts and that thinking, because I tell you it's so powerful, you have things like that, that makes them think about doing other work with their brain uh, versus getting back in that, that space they don't want to be at. 
Um, a second thing I do, I do this myself personally. Um, I keep a gratitude journal. And so that, you know, we live in a world of social media, right? And so I do find people um, can look and follow their friends and, um, you know, the friends are here, they're doing this, getting this, doing that. And the persons can feel, start to have anxiety or depression about what they're seeing others doing or what others are showing them, right? That does not necessarily mean that's actually what's happening. And so I find telling the um, clients, and I do this practice for myself as well, I keep my own gratitude journal and I do this with my kids. This is something that people, you know, can actually do with your children too. And that you're just every day, you're grateful for one thing and you write about that thing and you include that and you give thanks and you, and you find yourself that you, that will even give you a, a sense of peace that, Hey, I am so grateful. You know, it could be something as that the sun is shining today. I get to do, I mean, but just be grateful every day. So I keep in a grateful um, heart and just keep in a positive space that if I can just reiterate anything, those are two, two other things that you can add to, to maintaining a healthy state. Now, you've mentioned twice that the mind is extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. And I've heard, you know, two schools of thought. I've heard and read and researched some, some schools of thought feel that we're already using a hundred percent of our mental capacity. Whereas others say, no, we're nowhere near using. In your professional opinion, how much of our mental capacity do you feel that we're using now? I feel um, that when, and you, like you just read how the different things that I'm involved in, right? Correct. And so just think about, so our mind is really not for us to do so many things at once. When you look at it and you can get clear in your mind, that's where meditation comes in and helps me. Mm -hmm. When you can really get clear and find that clear space, mm -hmm. then you watch what your pro productivity does. And so once you get that space, and once you get that clear area where you can think and you can do things. So I think when you're just kind of running and it's chaotic, you, you're not at, you know, the highest, you know, mental uh, capacity that you can be. But I think that with uh, clear thinking, clear space, making time, keeping your uh, physical, uh, mental health aligned, that you can reach, you know, the highest mental capacity and thinking and productivity that you, you can and have a quality life at yeah. the same time. Okay. Yeah. And I accept that. I can agree with that yeah. also. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I could sense and see how once you have that inner peace, mm -hmm. you're able to do more because you're focused mm -hmm. and you're not allowing those external factors right. to dictate to what you can mm -hmm. and cannot do. Right. Phenomenal. And we talked about depression, anxiety. Mm -hmm. Where does dementia go? Does that play a role in our mental health? Mm -hmm. And is it is it something that's preventable and curable? Mm -hmm. Well, it's um I won't say it's curable. It is okay. a terminal uh, thing. It's progressive. Okay. Um, oftentimes we find clients uh, with dementia, they tend to uh, develop some mood disorder, meaning depression or anxiety, because, you know, things that they're doing every day for themselves, they no longer can remember to do those things. So you just think of the level of frustration any of us would have or, um, you know, change in your thoughts or mood when you can't remember what you need to do for yourself for that day. Um, sometimes you can find that a person, it leads into um, more of a psychotic uh, illnesses where the, their behavior changes. Mm -hmm. And, and when, when I say that, I mean, they may have thoughts and thinking that they typically didn't have before, or they may be more agitated or more irritable. A lot of times if you, um, if persons deal with uh, or have a family member with it, you tend to see them in the evening times. They may get really, really confused or concerned or scared. They just don't like change because they don't really know sometimes 
they may not even recognize their family members. And so you just think of the level of uh, frustration and disappointment and uncertainty, I should say, that that brings. And so we do tend to see that. And But sometimes because that population is uh, more elderly, in certain cases, we're um, sometimes at a disadvantage. You cannot give them some of the uh, dosage of the medications that we would ordinarily prescribe to someone else. And so you have to be careful with that. The neurologist is involved. Uh, it takes a multidisciplinary team in managing a person who has been diagnosed with uh, dementia and then is so showing symptoms of changes in their mood and their behaviors. That's, that's typically what we will see. You know, sometimes it can be aggressive and sometimes it, you know, can be combative. And sometimes they could just be pleasantly confused. So they're just smiling and laughing, but they, they don't really know what's going on around them. So they're not oriented, you know, to person, place, time, situation, but they're happy. And so, you know, I, for families, that's always a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, because I, mm -hmm. I, I do know some individuals personally who mm -hmm. has, you know, family members that's dealing with this. Mm -hmm. Do you feel it's preventable? No, I don't think. I don't think that, you know, and um, and that's where all the research is going with that, you know. Um, and we don't sometimes even know why, right? Yeah, and so I think that's the other challenging part uh, when we ask him why and we don't have those answers, right. you know. So that makes it a little more difficult because yeah. you want answers. You do. You do. Yeah. You want yeah. to try to make sure, you know, you're doing right. the, your best. So right. That, you know. Right, and get to that that stage. Mm -hmm. Now, I've heard and, and read aluminum cans, particularly you know food stored in aluminum cans, mm -hmm. may cause Alzheimer's. What, what I hadn't thoughts? heard about yeah. that. Okay. Yeah, I hadn't heard yeah. that. Yeah, I'm sure they have a lot of different uh, reasons out there or, or ideas. The or yeah. Facts, yeah, but I've not heard about that one. Yeah. So let me ask you one last question, uh -huh. and then we're going to to break. Whenever individuals are dealing with um, loved ones, mm -hmm. they need to be patient with those individuals. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, little children, because they don't know, and you know, it's really not talked about as much in the homes. Mm -hmm. They call them crazy. And and this is just my personal opinion because you know sometimes I kind of think a little differently. Mm -hmm. I think we all have a little crazy in us. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we just think about you know our spirituality, yeah. you know, we we pray to God. None of us have seen God. We don't know what God looks like. Um, we believe in Jesus, and Jesus has been dead forever. Mm -hmm. Some think, but I know that He is still alive. We read the Bible, who we say, or what, what we say is inspired by God, but it's someone we have not seen. Mm -hmm. So just stepping outside of myself and looking at that situation, I would say that, you know, millions of people are crazy because they're, they're believing in something they cannot see. But that's our reality. That's something that we have come to a consensus on and that's just who we are. How do we get individuals away from using the negativity, calling others crazy because mm -hmm. they are a little different? Yes, mm -hmm. they may have a mental disorder, yeah. but that doesn't make them no more crazy than I am. Right, right. And um, I think um, just going back to, to our earlier conversation, we have to continue these talks like we're doing in um, our homes, in our schools, in our churches, you know, our faith community, um, community events, because it's true. And it's, it, the, the data shows us that over 50% of Americans will be diagnosed with a mental disorder, wow. right? Uh, we have one in five children will be diagnosed at some point, mm -hmm. and same as one in five Americans. And so when you look at the number, it's happening more frequently than we think. And I know in the um, actual mental health community, as far as the mental health providers, 
it's even a big push for the providers to work on the language, mm-hmm. you know, and I'll just give you an example. A lot of times um, patients may be, like I said earlier, identified by their illness. That's Paul the schizophrenic, oh. you know, and so listen how negative it is instead of saying he is not his illness, he's an individual. That's Paul who has a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And so it's just changing the language and it's just like working at it and no, they're not crazy, but they're living with a mental health problem. And here's what this mental health problem is. And here's the the signs of this mental health problem. And I think it just comes down to educating. And I think it comes down to um, advocacy for this, this population. They're vulnerable. They're one of the most vulnerable populations we have. And people often think, and you see it happening in the news, every time something happens, oh, they had a mental health illness, right? You Mm -hmm. see it, right? They had a mental illness. And I just want to say that um, if you look at it, a lot of times a a person with a mental illness is mostly involved. They they may be the... um, they're not always the perpetrator. They are also a victim of violent crimes and taken advantage of. And so I think that gets missed. But every time something happens, that's what you see in the media, in the news outlets. And so I think that doesn't do anything for the stigmatization that we deal with every day. Because every time something happens, then that person has a mental illness. And then, but yet and still, they're not putting in the work to help these you know, patients and individuals who suffer. And so I think that we have so much work to do. We have so much uh, people need to be educated on. Um, It takes our uh, legislatures being involved and really having people in those uh, seats that's going to really push for mental health advocacy because it's such a need. And so I think that it starts in our communities. We have to have the right people elected. We have to have the right healthcare providers, because if I'm a healthcare provider that if somebody finally gains up enough strength to come into my office and sit across from me, but I do not reach them, then I've lost that person, right? And so even you have to have the right healthcare provider. I think it's a true call, and I don't think that any person can just go in and say they're going to just do this work. It's tough work. I feel like it's a call and it's a ministry within itself because you actually each day uh, just helping a person to um, just sort of gain hope, you know, and just to push that person that, hey, you can live Mm -hmm. when they don't want to. And so you don't take it lightly. And so I just think that um, it just starts there. Really? Yeah. And you did mention, I can't uh, end this without talking about it because it's uh, those numbers are steadily climbing mm-hmm. you mentioned if they want to live yeah sometimes individuals choose not, not to live. live right right and so yeah that's our um public health concern when we look at uh suicide it is a public health concern um according to the cdc the center uh, for Dis- disease control and prevention in 2017, 47,000 people died by suicide. And so that amounts to one person every 11 minutes. And so one person, one life loss is one too many. And so it's, it's everybody's problem. It's just not the mental health you know, team problem or a person living with mental health problem because we at some point can all be affected or impacted, may know someone who loses a loved one or a friend by suicide. And uh, so if you have a person that you know that is to that point and hopelessness is one of the major signs um, that they are seeking help. Um, and I was sharing with her earlier that this is uh, September is National Suicide Prevention Month. And so um, with that, you know, it's a whole huge month campaign, but it really is really something we should be looking at every day. Um, I mean, because the numbers are steadily rising, and even with our adolescent population, the numbers are rising. It's the second leading cause of death for um, that adolescent age group, um, you know, starting at 10 to like age 34. Second leading leading cause of death. And so it's serious. Mm -hmm. It's serious, and it's serious work. 
and we need um, to just be paying attention to it and doing more about it. Um, I know, you know, there's not a lot of researchers that focus on, but we need to actually have more attention paid to, to it. And so I would just say, if you um, all out there and you're listening and you know of someone who may be uh, dealing or living with depression, um, they've lost hope, you know, they've isolated, they've withdrawn, um, urged them to seek professional help. There is the um, crisis intervention line. It's 24 hours, seven day a week. It's confidential. Um, that number is 1-800-273-TALK. Um, there's always uh, someone help to help them. Like, or you can just get them to the nearest emergency room. And there's, uh, there's, there's help for them there. And so just reaching them where they are and just being there is the best thing you can do to let them know that you're not judging, that you're there to help them. So we're going to go ahead and end. We're going to recap. So the first thing you want individuals to do in order to maintain a healthy mental state, you want to manage your stress level. And you do that through exercise, proper diet. You also do that through meditation. And once you notice that something is out of alignment, the next best step that you would like to take is to get in contact with your professional mental health provider and discuss those concerns with him or her. And then the third thing, just be preventative and write down the things that you are grateful for. Oftentimes, a lot of us, we're on social media and we watch the things that others are doing and sometimes we allow that to dictate our life or bring anxiety or depression upon us. But once we focus on who we are and what we already have, then we're able to keep our mental state healthy. Do you have any last words for the listening audience, Dr. Joseph? I would just like to thank you all for joining. I would um, also just encourage you to um, join the talk, join in on um, any advocacy you can for mental health um, population is such a need. Um, and if we're going to address the stigma, if we address, if we're going to address the stigma, we have to start working together, educating and advocating for mental health in our communities. Okay. Know that life is a gift that keeps on giving. And each day that you are given the opportunity to wake up, See the life that you are destined to live. And you do that by keeping your spirit aligned with the one and true spirit, which is God. Next thing you want to do is make sure you keep your mind on things that are good and keep your body in a consistent, constant, conscious groove. Remember to love the person in front of you. Love the person behind you, love the person to the left of you, and love the person to the right of you. And know that I love each and every one of you. Go out and enjoy this absolutely beautiful Saturday, and I will see you next time. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks for joining.